All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so, for this lecture today, uh, the last lecture for our wealth hydraulics uh, chapter, I want to talk about what happens with uh, multiple wells, basically, or well fields or interaction between wells. So, we've seen uh, many different aspects of well hydraulics, so steady state and transient flows, basically, time drawdown, transient flows, both in confined and unconfined, and um, we also looked at slug tests in the last lecture, and then finally this last lecture is well fields. So a lot of this we've already seen, you know, some aspects of it, but I just kind of wanted to gather the information into this one lecture. Um, so there's basically three topics we'll talk about. Uh, the first one is dewatering, and there's a, an example of that uh, here on that uh, picture. Uh, you can see here the Chicago River on the right hand side. This is downtown Chicago. Uh, the sheet pile that's highlighted, you know, along basically a dam along the river to keep the water out. So you can imagine when they put the sheet pile on, they had to pump the water out of the uh, construction area and then they have to keep the water below grade basically as they uh, build the foundation, which is down there. You can see the scale here with the people working. Uh, this is probably, you know, or even the heavy equipment up there, you know, we're talking like many tens of feet, probably maybe in the hundreds, I, I wonder if it's over 100-ish, right? Uh, so lots of water to keep out of this uh, construction zone, uh, so we'll see how we do that. Uh, another aspect that we've talked about already is uh, pump and treat, um, pump and treat system, so we'll spend a lot of time uh, today on that. Uh, especially discussing kind of the uh, what we call the capture zone, which is that zone that we need that pollutant plume basically to be captured by the well. But the whole point, if we want to pump the pollution out of the ground, we need to make sure that all the pollution is pumped out and as little uh, clean water is pumped. So we'll see how that works and that's what we call the capture zone basically of the well. What is it that it captures basically? Uh, and then finally, I'll briefly mention boundaries again. Uh, we've done one example in one homework. Uh, already, so I'll just sort of recap that. So I'll start with an intro a general introduction and then we'll go through those three topics. Uh, okay, so again, these are the three topics, just a little more, you know, visuals for you. Uh, the dewatering, I want to remind you that this is basically what you have on the uh, cover of your book, of the Fetter book, right? That Excel, simple Excel with two wells, and I already gave you um, similar interfaces right in Excel that you can find in your codes folder again so you can see an example here with two wells you know uh, pumping with uh, constant boundaries that are equivalent on each side right so 15 meters 15 meters both sides and then you can see kind of what the water table is doing uh, again very simple model and you can see like the similarities basically with that cover in, on your book uh, obviously you can you know if you have that water table drop from the 15 meters to the you know, whatever it is in the middle there, it looks like maybe 11, 10, 11 meters, right? So now you dewater it, you know, four meters down and you can excavate in the middle and build some kind of a foundation. Uh, okay, the capture zone, again, just a reminder, we already saw sort of the GMS, or the pump and treat, I should say. Uh, the, the last GMS um, exercise you guys did, right, you saw that, you know, plume of pollutant, if you will, starting from one well is not quite captures, captured by the uh, pumping well, right? So this is a, a recharge well at the bottom, a dis uh, discharge well or a pumping well at the top. And you can see that the, if you start particles, you know, in the well that is pumping water in, uh, then those particles kind of go around the other uh, well. So this is good if, you know, this is a clean water well, right? You don't want that plume to go through, but if you wanted to design a pump and treat, you would have missed your objective, obviously, because now all the particles are going out of the uh, system. So it depends on the objectives, obviously. Uh, another example at the bottom, and I'll detail that a little bit, but, you, you know, there's several ways to do capture zones, and there's like type curves that we typically use, and I'll talk about these. Uh, the example at the bottom is an example with four wells to isolate that middle uh, zone, so you can really see graphically here that there's like a double layer of protection basically so if you have a pollution there in the middle uh, let me see if i can get my plume to work 
right? So you can see here you have a zone that is completely, completely protected, right? Well, you know, I'm not very good with this, but, but this entire thing is completely protected by this inner circle and then this outer circle, right? So it's, like, it's sort of a double protection. So there's two wells here, one here and one here, injecting water, right? And then two wells here, one inside and one outside, pumping water out, right? So they're, they're pumping over here, injecting over here, but the fact that we have two wells on each side sort of gives that outer ring protection. So if you have a pollution in the middle, you can really isolate it and treat. Uh, and finally, the boundaries. So this is, again, the example we've seen in the homework already uh, that corresponds to that river, um, that river example, right? So the river is keeping that a water table at a fixed uh, level and in order to solve these sorts of problems you have to have an image well that is injecting the equivalent water right so we'll, we'll review a little bit uh, this case at the end okay and again uh, what do we remember well what was that chapter 4 about right and and this is more the top of chapter 5 really because this is in uh, radial coordinates uh, but this all comes down to um, the equations, the steady state equations, right? So you can see those for confined and unconfined are written in steady state. Um, and the basic equations, right, are ignoring the angle, again, just talking about radius, assuming everything is isotropic, homogeneous, well-behaved. These are your basic equations. The point here is that both the confined and unconfined aquifers are linear equations, basically, right? either in H for the confined case or in H squared, right, for the unconfined squared, for the unconfined aquifer, excuse me. Uh, but if those equations are linear, you know, this is just a, a math rule, basically you can use superposition, meaning you can use solutions of any number of these equations and just add them up. This is really what it boils down to. Uh, there's a lot of math behind this and I could spend a whole lecture on it. Um, you can look up some information on that, but that's basically the idea. If you have linear equations, you know, all their solutions can be added for different uh, boundaries or conditions. And that's what we'll use when we, you know, talk about multiple wells. That's basically how we proceed. We just solve the problems, you know, one well at a time, and then we sum them up. That's really what it boils down to. And here is how that works, right? Um, so in the confined case here at the top, right, uh, again, I'm writing the uh, steady state, uh, the theme equation, if you will, at the top here. So H2 minus H1 equals discharge over 2 pi T, natural log ratio of the two observation wells, right? We've seen this over and over. Or again, you can flip this depending on what you want to uh, describe, right? You can flip it and just have Q equals blah, blah, blah. Same, same equation, just flipped around some. Uh, oh, and also written instead of head, it, uh, written in terms of uh, drawdown, right? So S1 minus S2 here, as you can see here. And again, we've done, we've used these equations, you know, a bunch now. So by now you should be hopefully familiar with those and there shouldn't be uh, anything new. Now, since we can use the superposition, right, uh, for multiple wells, we can just sum them up. So that, you know, if you look at these equations at the bottom here, 2 pi T S, again, this is in terms of drawdown now. So 2 pi T S, you can see this is this expression up here. 2 pi T S is right here. This is the whole thing, obviously, K B is T, right? Um, so 2 pi T S equals sum of the Q I's, right? Now this becomes a Q I, log of the ratio, and now we have R over R. Uh, in that bottom equation, right? So we transform this typical equation into an equation for each well. Now, big R here is going to be your radius of influence. And again, we've seen that, right? So for a steady state, we can calculate the radius of influence. Uh, for time drawdown data, then you have to replace this uh, radius of influence. So you, you have to add the time, right? So typically in operations, um, you're actually interested in how long is it going to take to say dewater my foundation so I can start working, right? So depending on your pumping rates and all that, uh, now you have to include time instead of using those uh, steady state equations. Again, the idea is the same. So here, uh, for a steady state case, right, 2 pi transmissivity, 2 pi t, 
draw down 2 pi t s equals the sum of all those wells, right? So q i would be the pumping rate of one well, and r i would be the distance of uh, that well to, you know, the place you're trying to calculate your drawdown. Um, now, if you're using a well, uh, a well field, so multiple wells with the same discharge rate, Q, if QIs are all the same, you can take Q out of the uh, equation, right, and then just, you know, put it on the left-hand side. Um, so this is, or, you know, even more simply, so those equations you will use in a couple examples, but um, in simple terms, right, at the end of the day, what you get is the drawdown, the total drawdown, right, is the drawdown due to all these wells. Again, this is just a statement of, you know, the superposition, basically. So the drawdown at some place, right, is the sum of all the drawdowns at that same place due to a bunch of wells, right? So we know how to calculate the drawdown, you know, away from a well, from our, you know, drawdown equations up here. Uh, so now we can just calculate it for each well and then sum them up. For an unconfined aquifer, and here I put a number of steps. I forgot to put the reference. I actually took this somewhere. I'll, I'll uh, try to add it to the PowerPoint. Uh, but anyway, so for unconfined, as you know, we have that H square business that we've been talking over and over about. Um, so what you do practically, right, is you do the same as we did before. So you, you treat it as, it as if it were a confined case, right? So you start with a confined case. Obviously, now your transmissivity is, you know, whatever the transmissivity of that unconfined is, so it's KH0, H0 being the head, you know, undisturbed head, the, uh, the stable level of the water. Uh, and then the storativity, if you're using the uh, unsteady equation, the transient uh, equations, right, uh, you add your SY instead of your storativity, okay? So for each production well, so for each well, you calculate the drawdown as if it were in a confined aquifer, except you use, obviously, instead of storativity, you use the uh, specific yield. Okay, then you get the sum, right? Like we just did before. The, the drawdown at some place is the sum of all the drawdowns, so you're good. Now, what you do is you correct. Like this is the new thing for the unconfined and dealing with that square business is that instead of just taking that sum like we did in the previous slide, now we are correcting this sum to find the proper uh, drawdown. So S is going to be your result, and you, S prime was the result you got before, right? So the equivalent confine that we just did in step two, this is this S prime number. So now we have S prime, we have the steady, the stable water table level, right? H0. So you can see now we only have H0, S prime, the equivalent confine, and that's it. So then you can calculate your actual drawdown for this unconfined case. Um, okay, and this is it. All right, so again, stepping into our topics, right? The first topics is dewatering. And again, the top left here is um, an example of, you know, multiple wells interacting with one another. So typically this is used for dewatering. I just, just a quick note, I'm not going to go into this too much here, uh, but this is also important obviously, or uh, you know, a way that it's not an advantage or a disadvantage is when you have multiple wells from private properties, right? Let's say your neighbor has a well uh, right here, right? Let's say this is your neighbor, right? And this is your house. Now your well, when you design your well, even though you have information on his well, now your two wells are going to interact. So you'll have to account for this. And let's say he has some, you know, foundation right here and he's expecting his stable level to be here, but now it's going to be here. This change in water level here can have important, you know, important repercussion on the stability of the source and all, all the geotech stuff, right? So, so there's, you know, the, in this lecture, I'm talking mostly about engineering well fields and how we use them, uh, but there's also issues with them, you know, when you put multiple wells in, in a uh, neighborhood or in a vicinity of each other. Okay, but in, in our case, right, if we're thinking just, uh, sorry, E, okay, if we're thinking of dewatering, well, this is basically how it works, right? You have two uh, wells, right, that dewater some part of the ground so that now you can excavate over here, right? This whole volume is now dewatered, so you can, you know, get your, and 
your machines in there and excavate and build your foundations. Once you're done, you know, with construction, then you can let the water come back. And then, you know, if the water level is here, for example, the stable water level, well, I'm, or at the t well, I guess that wouldn't work. But anyways, you get the idea, right? You can get all the way down here, make all this, you know, concrete, then build up top there, right? And now you have a construction on top and then you can let the water come back, right? This is the principle. So here on the right hand side, you have that little Excel model that I've already uh, talked about, right? So you have this in your code folder, so go look at it. But the point here, I guess, is that this is really simple to do because it is, um, superposition principle. So this is all solved by finite difference, right? And again, go into your Excel folder and look at those equations. It's pretty simple uh, how it works, but we're ju just solving those drawdown equations by finite differences like we've done before uh, without the pumping you know, rates. So now the pumping rates are included here. Um, so you can change those. But you can see you know, your contours are there, everything is there. So it's really easy. Like basically what you do is you, you tell Excel, hey, what is my, whoops, what is my transmissivity for this aquifer, right? Uh, what is the pumping rate that I want right here, right? Well, I guess the pumping rate is out, but... What is the pumping rate? And then you can play, you know, literally that's all you need. Like just plug the pumping rate in that cell and then Excel is going to give you a solution for the domain you have depending on your boundaries, right? So this is pretty easy uh, to do. And that's how most you know programs, engineering programs, are going to work. Uh, here, down here, is another illustration from a company, a private company that does you know dewatering. And this is pretty uh, typically what we use. So sometimes you just have like two lines of uh, well points. So basically, you don't have that you know third line here. It's just two big lines and then some kind of damming uh, at both ends. Or you can have those sort of circular or you know. Uh, well points all around your construction area, right? And this is reminiscent of that picture I showed you of the downtown Chicago, but that's pretty much how they work. You have like a, a big pump basically that is operating like a line, well, what they call well, well points. So each of those is like a little well, but this is all, you know, connected to a big pipe up top and a big, you know, pumping station and then typically some settling tank to get that dirt out of that water and then some discharge somewhere else. You get to get rid of that water. A uh, couple examples, so the first one here, and again, this is just reiterating sort of the equations from before, right, but Jacob, 1950, did an analysis on a circular um, dewatering system, so again, you can have circular, the one that I just showed is kind of rectangular, right, but it's the same idea, so if you take a circular dewatering system, uh, you can calculate the drawdown at the center, obviously that's what you would want, right, to know, because if you do Again, a circular, let's say this is circular here, right? Typically what you want to do is, you know, get some construction down here, right? This is where your uh, maximum drawdown is going to be, is near the center. So that's typically what you want to do. And then your well points would be, you know, all around here. That's kind of that design of this thing. And again, we don't know how many wells for now. So if you do it, uh, if you do a circular system, right, it's easy because we're in circular coordinates. So you get two pi t s divided by q is the sum of those uh, ratios. Okay. Uh, now that sum again, you can replace by n, right? Just n times this if q is constant. We already talked about this. So now you have n that replaces that sum, right? So the sum of those numbers, if everything is the same, right? Everything is at the same distance. Uh, now the you know, everything being the same, you can just replace that summation by just the number of them, right? So, again, if you do 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, however many that is, is 5 times 2, right? It's the same idea. Uh, okay, since uh, n times q is q total, right, uh, we can actually calculate the discharge that we need for a drawdown. Uh, so, if the, design uh, if the design parameter is drawdown, like we want to go down, you know, four meters, for example, we want to drive four meters down. Uh, this is our design parameter. Then you can calculate what uh, Q, total, Q total needs to be, right, given those equations. So this is really what 
what's need now. Once you know Q total, then you can decide on the number of uh, well points or just number of wells you need, depending on you know pumps that you have available and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but once you have your um, Q total, then you know you have uh, your n q basically. So then you can play with n and q i, if you will, right? So if you, let's say you put five wells, obviously you divide the you know the the amount that each well needs to pump. Okay. Uh, so the drawdown in the in each well, right, is the drawdown at the center plus um, this term here, again, n is the number of well that you'll use and the radius of your wells, right, and then the distance so that you can calculate the drawdown in the well. And oftentimes when we design the watering systems, and we'll show examples later, but oftentimes this is sort of the uh, design parameter, meaning like there's only so far down you can go, right, given an aquifer, let's say you have an unconfined aquifer and it's 20 meters down, Right. If you design a system and you need to have the drawdown at, you know, 18 meters, that's probably not, well. Even to exaggerate, let's say your aquifer is 10 meters and your design parameters give you a drawdown in the well at 15 meters. You know, more than you have water. Obviously, this is impossible, right? So that's where, uh, you know, playing with the number of wells comes because if you multiply the wells, right, each well doesn't have to draw down that far down meaning that now you have something that's acceptable, right? So this is really your limiting uh, parameter when you design those systems where you can't just pump, you know, to infinitely far. You have to, like, be reasonable and you that's your constraint, basically. So the number of well will depend on, you know, how far down you can uh, pump. Okay. Uh, so here's a, a worked out example. Uh, this is more of a case where, you know, you have two wells, let's say you have two neighbors, right, and you have two wells that are 100 meters apart, so really a basic example, basically just two wells, very simple, uh, both pump at 550 meters, uh, the transmissivity is 100 square meters per day, uh, each of them has a radius of influence of 1000 meters, uh, you get one observation well, right, uh, perpendicular, so it's there's a system that's like this, right? Boy, we have that line here. We have 1,000 meter radius of influence observation. So here is your observation well. Okay. Right? So this is your 75 here. Is your 100 meter here. Okay. Uh, calculate the drawdown in the observation well, right? So if you want to know the drawdown right here, right? And again, now you know the radi the radius of influence, so you can use that steady state equation. Uh, there's only two wells. We know everything. We know the transmissivity. We know the pumping rate. Uh, everything is given, basically. So you just solve, right? This is really how it works. Uh, so at steady state, you'll get four meters drawdown, you know, here. So if you have construction that requires less than four meters, you're pretty good. Well, I mean, four meters would be a little tight, I guess, but, you know, that's the idea. You can actually calculate what the drawdown is at some distance from those two wells, and that tells you, you know, how much you can dig, basically, right? Uh, again, in practice, what you do is you use some codes, typically. So again, this is the MATLAB, and I'm going to get into that pump and treat. But what I'm saying is those analytical sort of solutions, you know, uh, you know, they can be really efficient. They're pretty, obviously, they're really easy to use and they give you some sort of a priori guesstimates. Uh, but you can use those codes to get, you know, better, a better view of your actual area. And especially in complex systems where you have layers and everything, it's definitely better to go to some kind of a final difference code. Okay, so pump and treat, right? So, so far, obviously, all our wells were pumping wells and we were trying to dewater some region, right? So, that's how it is now. You can see the parallel here with the pump and treat systems that we've seen before, uh, where you have one pumping well, you know, extracting water. So, this is this one here, right? We're pumping water out of the ground, treat it in some facility, and then typically re-inject it, right? And this is the uh, injection well, so you have like that loop, right? So this water presumably 
is going back in and then you know some of it comes back out obviously and flushing that sort of flushing that uh, polluted groundwater. Uh, I already mentioned that but this is the last GMS right so again if, if these are two say if this is a drinking well and this is an injection well and gets polluted uh, then that's good right but if this was you know designed to do a pump and treat system you can see that the collecting well here the, the uh, the pumping well, the extracting well, is not actually capturing your plume, so that would be a bad design, right? Uh, so how do we know a priori what that uh, capture zone? So for this well here, there's a zone here that it's capturing water from. Well, it's probably bigger than that, actually, but anyways, you get the idea. But there's a zone around that well that's capturing water, right, where the water comes from, basically. And in pump and treat design, this is really what you want to know, okay, when, when you design the thing, you want to know, okay, where is my plume of pollutant and how do I design a well that is going to capture that plume, that this is really what the whole capture zone comes from. Okay, so I put here the reference and the paper is in your paper folder, uh, great paper, really simple to read through or to follow, so it's, it's really a good read uh, for simple design. Uh, the way we do capture zone design typically is by uh, using those uh, type curves again, so we've we've seen those graphical methods and type curves over and over and over again. So there is some uh, semi-analytical or analytical solutions. Typically, they you need an iterative process to solve them. So you can do this in Excel real quick or MATLAB or anything. Uh, but again, the 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 design itself is already all solved. So for one well, you can see it here. Uh, you have one pumping well, and those line here, those lines here. Uh, illustrate some capture zones but for different uh, Q over VU and I'll explain that in a minute but the idea here is okay if you have a plume that is basically this shape and when I say a plume I mean a pollution right so if you had a plume that is roughly this shape right well then this first um, this first capture zone design here would be good enough right so if, if your plume is smaller than this then you can design for this. Now obviously if your plume is you know, bigger than this, let's say it's like this big, if this is the pollutant you know, extent in the ground, well then you know, obviously this, you're going to miss some if you design for this first line here, so you have to design something, a bigger system, right? Now what that Q over BU is that parameter, right? That's, that's the parameter that describes those lines, and you can see that Q over BU goes up as we go away, and what that um, means, right, is that Q goes up, basically, right? So again, B is the um, B is the thickness of the aquifer, right? Like we've been using before. U here is actually your Darcy flux. I, I put a note here because this is straight from the paper, and again, different people, different uh, tastes, I guess. So U here in this case is just Darcy flux. Okay, so it's what we call Q. Um, so this is an interesting point that I haven't made yet, but Q over BU, right, if you look at the units, uh, it's really the essence of this whole, uh, you know, Wells Hydraulics chapter, if you will, right. So there's a tension, there's a, yeah, there's a, literally a tension between the pump, the Q, and the aquifer capacity to give you water, which is that uh, BU, basically, or this transmissivity, right, so if you will, BU is also, if you think of it, right, B, well, let me call it B little Q to follow our usual um, definitions, right? This is uh, B, K, D, H, D, X, right? Q is Darcy's law. So this is transmissivity. Right, and this is the hydraulic gradient, sometimes called I, right? So BQ is also TI, if you will, right? BQ equals transmissivity times the hydraulic gradient. Okay. Now that means, again, that there's that tension between your discharge, Q, right, divided by the transmissivity and the hydraulic gradient, which are what supply the water, if you will, right? The higher hydraulic gradient, there's a higher you know, pressure, if you will, there's a higher flow, right, there's a higher gradient, higher slope, that the water is, you know, gravity going down, 
and then the higher the transmissivity, right, the higher, you know, the more water you can flush through this aquifer. So this is really your tension. Now, if you look at the units, right, Q over BU has units of meters, okay? Units of meters, this is why those lines, actually, when you do this calculation of Q over BU, that gives you basically a width that you can capture. And again, this is the whole idea between the capture zone and the pump and treat, is that the, the size of the treatment zone, if you will, of the capture zone, what we call this capture zone, depends on all those parameters, right? So again, for a given BU, then you need more and more Q to go away and away, right? But then vice versa, right? So if you have a given Q, right, the bigger the BU, the smaller the plume you need, right? Q over BU. So if you divide by your large BU, you don't need, you know, much area, right? Because the, f the flow is readily going in. So if you want to go away from it, you know, you need a larger and larger Q, basically. Or smaller and smaller BU. Okay, so this is literally what you use. Basically, this is for a one well, so pretty simple. Now for a two well, and again, you have these equations. So these equations are pretty simple for one well. So you can see Y here, which is the Y axis, obviously. This is that sort of Q of a BU thing, right? Q of a BU. And you can see here there's a inverse tangent of Y over X. And again, that represents the gradient, right? Um, we've seen that before. Uh, but, you know, you can see this equation is pretty simple. Now, as soon as you have well field, so... And again, the, the, the way this works, right, and there's an example in this paper that I'll ask you to read. Uh, but again, the, 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 the design parameter, the constraint on your design is going to be the drawdown in the well. So let's say you have this plume, or you have a big plume, right, and you need, you know, you need to treat all this. So you can do for one well, you can do the whole design. You place your plume, you look at what you need. Well, let's say you need now this 1600, you know, line, basically. To capture the whole width of your plume, okay. Well, you go to the 1600 Q of a BU. Well, given uh, for a given BU, that may be a ton of uh, Q that you need a lot of energy, right? Uh, or then when you have this, you can calculate the drawdown um, in the well, and then you realize that for this Q, you know your draw, your drawdown is going to be insane. It's going to be like really really low, and that's not practical. So then you redo it if it's too much, right? If you're limited by the drawdown. If the drawdown is too much, then you go to a two-well design, okay? So there's another type curve for two wells. You kind of fit that around your plume. And now with two wells, obviously, right? Because wells interact, you can see how now your drawdown is not as dramatic if you have two wells for the same work, for the same queue, basically. Again, those equations are slightly different, right? But uh, don't worry about this. This is all, again, type curve, so you kind of fit graphically just like I did here with my pen. Same thing, right? Two wells, if it's still too deep, then you go to three wells, to four wells, right? So you can have typically like two, three, and four well design is kind of what you do. And they're typically in a line here. So if you have a two well design, you have one well up here and one well down here, right? And you get essentially the same thing or the same capture zones, but now not as much drawdown. They're slightly different, obviously, your capture zones, but they're similar. Uh, and that's how it works. Now, this YD here is that um, the position of your... Uh, if I could find the term for it, your stagnation point, there it is. Uh, I thought I had put a figure where the stagnation point was uh, given, but, you know, for a given capture zone here, you can see that there's a stagnation point, and this is, you know, where it's, you know, where it is, basically. So this gives you also, like, kind of the distance from your well to the stagnation point. Um, now, a note of, you know, important note, or something really important to understand for... Uh, for pump and treat and capture zone concepts is that they're different from drawdown, right? So for the dewatering, I told you because we can use superposition, it's really easy. You just have two wells, you just calculate the two wells independently, and then you sum them up and you get the drawdown. So this is how dewatering works. For pump and treat, right, what we're interested in is the capture zone, which again is completely, well, it's not completely different, it's related, but it is not the, the drawdown, right? So you have those definitions. This is a really good uh, report where you can sort of read through these concepts of pump and treat and how that works. But these, I really like this top um, this top graph here where you can see this one well, the extraction well with the circular drawdown around it, right? But because there is a regional flow, right? So now the flow is 
uh, actually left to right, right, 996 down to 988, right? So we have flow this way, and the capture zone is basically a the interaction between the original flow and the actual drawdown from the well. So the, you can see that the shape of the capture zone is completely different from the actual drawdown uh, of the well. Uh, and another illustration here is this would be sort of your stagnation point here that I described before. So if you have a pumping well here and this is your original you know, slice, you can see that even though there is drawdown here, right, the water is still flowing away from the well. So this is not captured by your well. It, the well is capturing only up to here. So again, drawdown and capture are two different things, right? So even though there is drawdown here, because of the regional slope, right, now there is actually flow away from your well, not into your well. So if you have pollution here, it doesn't work. Okay, so again, capture zone and drawdowns are different things. Uh, and another illustration of sort of more advanced pump and treat solutions, right? So I've, I've shown you before, like one well pumping, one well uh, pumping in and pumping out, if you will. Uh, here's an example with two wells, and this is a really nice paper. Again, this is a little more advanced, obviously, but I put that in your paper folder as well, uh, where you have an inner and outer ring, basically, of wells, right? So you can see this uh, uh, inner pair of wells, which is what we've seen before, with this well here pumping in, right? Uh, and then you can see the flow lines going to the pumping out extraction uh, well here. So that's what we've seen before. Uh, this is your stagnation point for that pair of wells, and you can see there's a nice cell inside. Now, the problem is in practice, because of dispersion and other things, right, you'll typically miss some, some water, right? It's really hard to design a, a two-well system that captures 100% of the water. So what they propose here in this paper uh, is an outer ring where basically this outer ring serves to completely isolate the inner ring. So it's not really directly designed to treat water, it's just designed to really isolate that inner cell so that none of the pollutant goes out. So you can see in here like nothing can go out because literally there's another ring outside that keeps that inner ring you know, completely isolated for the, from the, the original uh, flow. Okay. Uh, and here on the right, again, my little Excel, you know, equivalent uh, or similar thing. And you can see here, I, I just plotted this Excel results that find a difference result, result in MATLAB. And you can see again that inner ring that is completely isolated. Even though my, I have weird boundaries that are not very far from my wells here. Uh, just because Excel, right, it takes many, it would take a really big spreadsheet. So I could do this in MATLAB much easier. But again, for graphically showing you, I kind of like using the Excel thing how the finite difference work. Uh, but now the problem with that is that I have very limited amount of cells that I can use, right? And my domain is definitely not uh, infinite. So I have, you know, boundary issues basically that uh, reflect on my system. But you can still see that if I use four wells, you know, I have a really clean inner cells, inner cell. So if I had, you know, if I had a plume that was right here and I wanted to, you know, uh, clean that up, right? This four well system works really well. Um, Okay, and that brings us basically to this boundary issue uh, problem. And again, I'll go quickly through this because we've done an example already here, uh, but that is based on superposition again. So I just kind of wanted to remind you here and show also the plots in Feder. This is kind of the end of the chapter in Feder as well. So the case we did for the homework is this case with a river. This case down here, right? There's a river that maintains a constant head, right? So it's a recharge boundary because there's a, it's recharging, you know, the groundwater. It, there's, you know, there's water in that river, so it never goes dry. Well, it can go dry if you pump too much, but anyways. The idea is that this is recharging, replenishing, so that you have a fixed boundary here, just like we did in Excel when I said, you know, my boundary on the left is 10 meters and it never changes, but basically like having a river there that just maintains that level at 10 meters no matter what. So now when we have a, a well pumping in this aquifer, right? So on the left-hand side, it's doing its thing, right? It's doing its uh, radius of influence, but on the right-hand side, right, it can't really do its radius of influence because here there's a river, right, that just keeps adding the water, so you can pump all you want. This never changed. Now, the way you model this, right, to, to get to that actual drawdown, uh, to model, you know, between the river and the, and the well, 
the way you can mull it easily, and that's what you did for your homework, is by adding a recharge well, an image solution, basically, it's called. And again, this is the idea of superposition. It means that to represent this river flowing water in, what we do is we place a, a well, we, an actual well, here, and we say, well, this guy is going to provide uh, the missing water, if you will. So you put a recharge well on this side uh, that is doing this, the same amount of in that our original well does out, right? So Q is the well, pump, the pumping well Q. Now what you do is you put an image solution, so you put another well at the same distance from that boundary away from the boundary on the other side, right? So you fake it, basically. You tell it, hey, this is what, you know, what I'm doing here. I'm putting water in. And what that does, in, in, you know, when, once you have those two solutions, you sum them up. Again, same thing, right? That's the same idea. So you can see here the cone for the uh, recharge well here, that dashed line here, right? And the cone for the original, that dashed line down here, right? The original uh, well, in, uh, independent of the boundary. And now when you sum those two dashed lines, you actually get, right, you can see those black lines that are the proper solution that is given here. So this is literally how you treat boundaries, you know, when you want to do them this way. Obviously, if you have a discharge boundary or meaning if you have a, an impermeable confining material here, right, uh, let's say a granite outcrop uh, at some point uh, that comes into contact with your porous material where your aquifer is, um, now you do it exactly the same, except now this is, you, you do the boundary as a pumping well instead of a, a recharge well, right? So you, you can see here the recharge well has, you know, you're adding water, virtual water to the system here. In the case of an impermeable boundary, you remove water, right? So it's like, like if it were a pumping well right there. Again, you calculate each well independently, then you sum them up, and you can see those black lines are the solution for these kinds of boundaries. All right, so this is how you treat them, you know, uh, if you want to do superposition of wells, you know, with semi-analytical uh, solutions. Otherwise, you can just have the final difference, you know, codes that we've done in Excel or in some, you know, professional software like GMS, and then, you know, just plug in the um, proper boundaries, and then, you know, if this is a no-flux boundary, then this is a no-flux boundary in the uh, final difference code, and then the, the final difference code itself just takes care of that, basically. And finally, the final uh, plot that I want you to talk about here today is this uh, drawdown versus time again. So basically, I've allu alluded to the uh, time drawdown data during this lecture. Uh, and again, I'll have you read uh, a piece of the Javondel paper um, where there's a really good example that tells you sort of the process for that. Uh, but again, I, I sort of alluded to it, but always use sort of steady state uh, approximations, right, for the examples I gave. Uh, here is an example of the time drawdown, right, theoretical drawdown. So this is kind of the straight line method that we've seen before. Let's assume this is in a confined, in a confined aquifer, right, that would be your uh, Cooper-Jacob uh, solution, the early ones, the straight line method that we've seen early on, right, so it's just straight forever. Now if you have a recharge boundary, right, and this is to remind you again of what we've seen many times, uh, before, right? So let's say uh, if you're in an unconfined aquifer, right, you have that at late times you have that or at intermediate time I should say or a leaky confined or an unconfined. At intermediate time you have additional water coming from gravity basically coming from the top and that's like a recharge boundary, right? Remember you, you go away from that line uh, if you have a recharge boundary. Now if you have a discharge boundary or a barrier or an impermeable boundary like the one we just did with the granite outcrop is the opposite problem, right? So now you have less water uh, than you would otherwise, right? So the drawdown needs to go down and down and down and down faster, right, than it would otherwise. So this is just a reminder that everything is uh, linked together. Okay, I think this completes our lectures on wells hydration.